We are breaking down the debate tonight and getting some local voices on it as well. Major issue that came up kind of towards the end of the debate, health care, affordability, the future of the Affordable Care Act, the things that took place during the Trump administration. Let's hear what they had to say. <clears throat> if we can come up with a plan that's going to cost our people, our population, less money and be better health care than Obamacare, then I would absolutely do it. But until then, I'd run it as good as it can be run. So just a yes or no, you still do not have a plan. I have concepts of a plan. I'm not president right now. But if we come up with something, I would only change it if we come up with something that's better and less expensive. And there are concepts and options we, we have to do that. As I've been vice president and we over the last four years have strengthened the Affordable Care Act, we have allowed for the first time Medicare to negotiate drug prices on behalf of you, the American people. Donald Trump said he was going to allow Medicare to negotiate pr drug prices. He never did. We did. And now we have capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month. Since I've been vice president, we have capped the cost of prescription medication for seniors at $2,000 a year. And when I am president, we will do that for all people. OK, this was uh, very interesting because there were uh, two different things I want to point out. But first, let's kind of point out the obvious thing that jumps out. They talked about replacing the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. and what his plan would be for that. He has a concept of the plan. And I want to turn kind of the argument he made against Vice President Harris back to him. Because when she said, talking about the economy, well, you've been there for three and a half years. He's had nine years now. <laughs> Yeah. To come up with a plan, I feel like he probably should have had something to talk about here, and it, it was clear he didn't. Yeah, especially for somebody who, as president, his Congress uh, attempted, you know, 60 times at least uh, to repeal the Affordable Care Act. You'd think you'd have a backup plan if you cared about it that much. And, and it seemed like, you know, in the last debate when it was President Trump and President Biden, one of the things that President Biden, I mean, President Trump would do would just kind of sit there, make a confused look when Joe Biden was kind of saying some things that might have been confusing. It seemed like Kamala Harris was doing that in this mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. When he talked about concepts of a plan, she just kind of looked and kind of shook her head up and down, mm -hmm. kind of turning the tables on that. How much, when it comes to health care, uh, Jay, does this hurt the former president to, to be talking about a plan but not have one when she laid out several different uh, policy points on health care? Well, I mean, it, it helps him make his point that Obamacare bad, me good kind sure. of thing. But as far as following through, I mean, what we saw was basically a repeat of his four years as presidency kept talking about replacing Obamacare but never actually being able to do it and I think the reason for that is because there's a lot of parts of Obamacare that are pretty popular mm -hmm. and getting even Republicans in Congress to go along with I mean mm -hmm. we we they talked about the 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 vote in in the Senate at late at night where it was the the last ditch attempt to get rid of Obamacare failed because of the fact that there's a lot of stuff in there that even Republican senators didn't feel comfortable getting rid of. Which is interesting. This is another uh, a topic where there's kind of like a mirror here where he pointed out for the vice president all the things that they want to do with student loans, but they couldn't mm -hmm. get it passed in Congress. But this is an issue where he's something he really wanted to get done. He couldn't get it passed in Congress. So kind of a, a mirror image there. But for, for Vice President Harris, the question that was uh, pinned to her about health care was about her support for Bernie Sanders' uh, health care for all. She, what she did with her pivot on that, because it was clearly a pivot, mm -hmm. because a lot of the things when it talks about former policies right. and that, mm -hmm. she didn't want to really touch. So what she pivoted on is my last three and a half years, years of vice president, I have supported a private option. Mm -hmm. So this strategy to, because she's going to be asked about changing positions mm -hmm for the right. rest of the campaign. Mm -hmm. This strategy of then saying just, well, this is what I have as vice president. Mm -hmm. So not going back, does that, is that an effective strategy, do you think? I think it's, it's fine. Politicians evolve all the time, mm -hmm. right? And when you're running in a primary, you're appealing to different kinds of voters. And so you're gonna say different things. She was a very different candidate in 2019 than she is today. Um, and I think, you know, once you serve at the national level like she has, rather than a senator from California, your positions change and they evolve. And so I think that's natural. 
And Jeannie, you know, she kind of talked about values mm -hmm. and, and would tell her story, her personal mm -hmm. story, go to personal anecdotes as well, mm -hmm. but again, would avoid the talk about the policies mm -hmm. that she has supported mm -hmm. previously. Yeah, that that's that you you were reading my mind because <laughs> um, I have that power. Sometimes. Yeah, you do. <laughs> Apparently, you do because precisely because she has this policy record that has a lot of movement in it. That's why it's so important now for her to lay out some plans. You know, what I'm hearing from swing voters is that we, they would really like to vote for someone mm -hmm. instead of against someone. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that she offered enough concretely to, to create that for candidate instead of I'm worried about Donald Trump and that's why I'm voting for you. If I can say though, she also invited people. You know, mm -hmm. she really, they, she, Democrats have been inviting people to their tent, right? And a lot of Republicans have signed on as well um, to support her. So there is there is some of that. Mm -hmm. We talk about that because when a lot of this debate kind of turned that switch into former comments uh, from the former president and things like that, voting for versus voting against somebody, that kind of gets lost then because we're talking about things in the past. And one of those topics about the past is the accepting the loss of the 2020 mm -hmm. election. Yeah. That was a question that came up and here are the answers to that. You have said, quote, you lost by a whisker, that you, quote, didn't quite make it, that you came up a little bit short. I are said you, that. Are you now acknowledging that you lost in 2020? No, I don't acknowledge that at all. But I you said did that say sarcastically. That. You but know those... that. It was said, oh, we lost by a whisker. That was said sarcastically. Look, there's so much proof. All you have to do is look at it. And they should have sent it back to the legislatures for approval. Donald Trump was fired by 81 million people. So let's be clear about that. And clearly he is having a very difficult time processing that. But we cannot afford to have a president of the United States who attempts, as he did in the past, to upend the will of the voters in a free and fair election. Yeah, so they go back to, to that claim. It's something that even candidates he have, has endorsed across the nation have brought up. It hasn't been exactly a winning issue for those candidates. I can say it was brought up in Pennsylvania when Doug Mastriano ran against Josh Shapiro. That was one of the things voters didn't like, is hearing about the denial of election results. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that the Trump campaign's not very happy that this ended up being a part of, of the debate tonight. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on that. Well, I think it's part of a broader strategy. I think Harris went into this debate tonight trying to remind voters mm -hmm. of the anxiety they mm -hmm. felt mm -hmm. when Trump was president, and it was capped off by by January 6th. So I think uh, it, it was, it, it, she jumped on that when it became a, a question in the debate. Is it kind of that thought process that, that, that she's been putting out there, turning the page on the past, remind voters of the past, and then talk about what the future is? Mm -hmm. Is that, that seems to be what, what she's trying to do. I think so. And I think, you know, in politics, um, history is short. Our memories are really short, as Jay suggested. And I think that, you know, we, there are lots of things that even I sometimes have to remember about, you know, what happened under Trump. You know, COVID now in some ways seems so long ago. <laughs> this time-space continuum that we're in, it's, you know, it's sort of strange. Where life stopped for a while. Yeah. 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 But, um, but, yeah, I think there is, because I think a lot of us have forgot, as Jay said, this anxiety um, there was always sort of waking up like what happened today or what happened last night, what, you know, and I think that that, yeah, reminding people and then moving forward, pivoting to the future. I think she she did an effective job of that throughout the evening. And real quick, because we're, we're starting to run out of time. We had a full hour, and it's weird that we are running out of time. Yeah. But Jeannie, you want to talk a little bit about foreign policy. You yeah. know, they brought up the, the uh, wars in Ukraine, the wars in Gaza. It didn't seem like a, like a long focus, though, tonight. 
So what, what, what were your general takeaways from what the candidates <clears throat> brought tonight on these issues? Well, as you know, it's typical for it to not be a, a long focus. And, you know, one of the things that we probably all do in our classes, in addition to just having students read the actual Constitution, is remind them that many of these issues that they're debating on, they have only limited influence on. You know, those issues have to run through Congress. But foreign insecurity policy is somewhere that the executive has extraordinary power. And that power has only grown over the decades. And so really, these debates should have a much stronger dose of foreign and security policy in them and comprise much more of the debate time than they currently do. And, and Jay, it's probably because Polling shows that a, like a, a voter who's <laughs> not glued to the TVs, eating candy like we were, <laughs> isn't really listening on foreign policy. Yeah, I mean, there, there has been research over the years. There was an article, a journal article about foreign policy and its importance, and the title was Dancing Before a Blind Audience. It, 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 candidates can talk about it all the time, but it just doesn't resonate with a lot of voters because it seems so distant to them. Mm -hmm. And Jeannie yeah. wants that to change. I know. <laughs> we'll change it, Jeannie. We'll work together. We'll change it. Folks, we have to take another break. We'll be right back. Thanks for joining us so far.